Okay, welcome to Course 1, Unit 1, Lesson 2, Evaluating a Small Business. Okay, in this course we are going to learn four objectives. First, we're going to describe a small business model. Uh, next, we're going to look at how money flows through a small business. We're going to look at a comparison of a small business to a large business. And then we're going to do really basic valuation techniques for a small business. Okay, so let's describe a small business. Um, in order to do that, we'll start with an with a uh, owner. Let's have a very wise and knowledgeable owner named Nancy. Now, in this scenario, we only have one owner, just Nancy. That's it. As you get more into the advanced lessons, you might have a hundred thousand owners as you start dealing with the stocks and really large corporations. Regardless of how many owners there are, you need to always remember that owners own the business. Now you might be laughing, but that simple concept is something that people will really get confused. I've heard people say that they've bought shares and they think that they're like one of the company's employees. And I mean, some people really get some twisted ideas whenever they think that they buy a share or a stock and that they are anything but the owner. But that's what you are. You're the owner when you buy shares of a business. So just keep that in mind as we go through this small business scenario. Okay, in this scenario, let's say that Nancy had an idea for a small ice cream business that she put in the parking lot at a mall. Since Nancy's kind of old, she doesn't actually like to work at her business. She doesn't want anything to do with her business. The business, she's going to hire one person to run the stand, to sell the ice cream, to manage all the finances, to do everything. And all Nancy's going to get at the end of the year is a check on how much her business made. So her employees are going to run the entire business. And I use that model in that scenario because whenever you get into this to buying stocks, that's what the scenario is as an owner, as a shareholder. You're not working for the company. Now you can, you can, you can do both, but when you're doing valuing techniques and you're trying to figure out the intrinsic value of a business, you always want to look at it from the standpoint that you are not physically working in the business. You are an outside owner and that everything that happens inside of that business is going to be paid to you um, and, and you're not in there actually eating up the income that it's producing. Okay, so that's the second part. So you first have to have an owner. The second part, you have to have a business. And then the third part is you've got to have the customer. Those are the three parts. Regardless of the size of the business, you could have this just small little ice cream stand that Nancy owns, or you could be talking about General Electric. Those three pieces are always in the model. So now that we've got the model established, the owner, the customer, the business, let's look at how money flows through Nancy's business. Okay, so this is just in one hour, um, and mind you, I, I've never owned an ice cream stand, so I really have no idea what it generates and how much it costs to run one, but I'm just going to throw out these generic figures as we go through this. So the flow of the money in one hour of Nancy's ice cream stand. So we start off at the beginning and we look at the customer. Okay, the customers go to the business and they spend $100 in one hour. So that would be the total revenue. Now, as I go through these figures, you want to absolutely remember the terminology because I'm using terminology that directly relates to stock investing. So whenever we go down that, that path a little bit further, all these terms are going to translate over. So the total revenue would be that money that all those people spent. So that $100 comes into the ice cream stand and we're not even talking about any of the costs that Nancy had or the, the employees that are working for Nancy had while they were running the ice cream stand. As you take that $100 and you walk across, now we step inside the business and we see where that $100 goes. Okay, so $20 of that $100 in that hour time frame went to her one employee. Now we're just using one employee to keep things simple and that one employee manages everything from scooping the ice cream to starting it to keeping track of the books and everything. She's Nancy's paying her $20 an hour. We had $20 go straight out of the hundred right off the top. Then we got the cost uh, and, this, and these are all cost of revenue all each one of these that I'm mentioning. The next one is the material cost. So it costs money to make the ice cream, to have the milk, to do whatever it takes, the bowls, the uh, spoons that they're going to have to hand out, all that costs money. So we're just going to say that that was $40. And then the last one that I threw in there was the, the cost for the land or for her shack that she's paying. You know, she might not have it paid off, but that cost per that hour, if we you know divided it all out, would be, let's just say $10 for that hour that she had to rent that space. So when we add up all those numbers, that's called the cost of revenue. OK, 
Okay, so we had the revenue, which was 100, but the cost to get that revenue was $70 combined. When we took the 100 and we subtracted the 70, we were left with $30. So that's the income before the taxes. Nancy's business made $30 in income before taxes. So let's just assume that we take $10 out for the taxes and that leaves us with $20 of net income for the earnings. That term is vitally important. You want to write that down five times in a row and then write it down another five times in a row. You never want to forget that term, net income. And whenever you get into um, investing in shares and in stock, that net income, when you divide it down into a one share, is called the earnings. So that's why I have both of those, those terms up there. Your net income and your earnings are pretty much the exact same thing. The only difference is when you talk earnings, you're talking for one share. So when a person says earnings, you need to listen because that is a very, very important term. When a person says net income, you need to listen because that's pretty much the most important term you can understand because that's the end result. That's that's the money that has gone through the process and that is left over on the tray sitting right there for you as an owner. So that's the owner's money. And when you own a share, when you own one share of a business, those earnings, that is your money. Never forget that. Okay. So the $20 is what's left at the end. That's your net income, your earnings, and the owner now has the choice to do what they want with that $20. So Nancy in this situation, you can see I have two arrows there, one pointing towards Nancy and one pointing towards her business. She can take that $20 that she earned in that one hour and she can pay herself or she can put the money back into the business so that the business can make more than $100 in an hour. So she can invest in a lemonade squeezer or a, you know, a new ice cream machine that's going to produce more income. And she could do this too. She could take $10 for herself and just pay herself. And she could take $10 of that earnings and put it back into the business. And that's what you'll see a lot of businesses do is that they take a cut and they also put money back into the business. So that's the thing is, is that earnings can go two directions and that's something you absolutely have to understand. When you start talking about stocks, the money that's going towards the owner is, is a dividend and the money that's going back into the business can be retained in the equity, but we'll get into that later. So the, the main thing I want you to really understand is net income earnings, very important number, and it can be paid to the owner or back into the business. Okay, so we understand that model. That model makes sense for pretty much anybody as they look at that because it's just really easy to understand. So when we look over here, I'm going to do a comparison between a small business and a large business. So as you look on the left, there's that small business that we just talked about and how we saw the money flow from the customer to the business and then to the owner. So when you talk about a large business, it's the exact same thing like we had said. So let me put some pictures in here to represent how that bigger business looks. So a lot of people have heard board of directors, but they have no idea what that really means or where that fits in the grand scheme of things. But now you do. As you look at the schematic here, you can see that the owners, the board of directors represents the shareholders. So let's say you went and bought 10 shares of GE. Okay. You, your voice as an owner is represented by that board of directors, those people sitting there in those chairs. They're, you know, huge shareholders. They might own 10 million shares of the company. And because they own so many shares, that's why they are a, mem a member of the board of directors. But when you own, let's say you just own 10 shares, you have a voice and you have a voting power with those shares. And that voting power is delegated to one of those board of directors. Okay, so those board of directors represent the shareholders and they're the ones that are actually, you know, representing all the owners for that one specific business. So we'll just call this business GE, General Electric. Okay, and those are, we'll just assume that those are the board of directors. So as you step down to the business itself, this is where the CEO, which a lot of people know that term, and the CFO and all those, those are all employees. They're, they can be owners at the same time. But their role as the CEO is he's the he's the head guy. He's the guy in charge of making sure that the product that, that we'll say GE is producing here is actually being made and that everyone is is being paid on time and that all the products are being pushed out on time. So a lot of the times people get confused between like board of directors and CEO, but that CEO is an employee and that CEO works for the board of directors and all them shareholders. And then your customer doesn't change. Customer's still uh, 
you know, buying up the product. Okay, so let's value the business, and that's what we're really getting at here, and that's our last uh, objective is, so what's this thing worth? You know, as, as we look at that first scenario and Warren Buffett says that the company's worth um, $40, but it's trading for 30, how does he figure that out? How does he possibly look at something and figure out what it's worth? So this is a really generic scenario of how, how you can understand what a business is worth. So let's try to value Nancy's little ice cream stand business. We know, and, and what I did here is I changed the cash flow from being one hour to one year. And all I did was just throw some zeros on all those numbers. And you can see instead of it being $100 coming in for the total revenue, now it's $100,000 coming in. So the revenue comes into the business at $100,000. It cost her $70,000 in order to make the $100,000. That's your cost of the revenue, which leaves you $30,000 before the income tax. You take $10,000 out for the taxes, which leaves Nancy $20,000 in net income or earnings for a year. So what's that worth? If Nancy was going to try to sell this ice cream stand, what is it worth? And that's, I'll tell you what, pause, I want you to pause the video and I want you to think about what would you be willing to buy this business for knowing that you are absolutely going to make $20,000 and you're not going to have to work one hour in order to get it. Your employee is going to take care of everything. You're just going to make the $20,000. It's a hypothetical question, but think about that. Okay, now that you've thought about that question and you paused the screen and you thought about, let's look at some different values here. We know that the net income or the earning is $20,000. Nancy doesn't have to do anything. She's just going to get paid that $20,000 after one year. So what would she be willing to pay in order to earn that $20,000 after one year? So let's just say $400,000 is what somebody's going to buy this business for. So if you had $400,000 and you purchased this ice cream stand and everything was running you know, smoothly, the employees weren't leaving and all the stuff that you typically run into with an ice cream stand, let's just assume that it's running like a top and there's no problems, she could expect to get a 5% return on that investment okay? because she's going to get $20,000 at the end of one year and she paid $400,000 for it. That's 5%. So then we go to $200,000. If, if, if you could buy that business for $200,000, one year later, you'd make your $20,000 because that number doesn't change. It's, that's the net income. That's what that business makes in a year. That investment, that, that purchase price would yield 10% on your money. Okay, And as we obviously look down to $100,000, if you could buy that business for $100,000, you're going to make 20% on your money. As you look at those figures, you can see th this is the this is the point that I really want you to take away. Her business never changed. Okay, that business stayed exactly the same. It, it was making twenty thousand dollars through each of those three scenarios. But you can see that the expected return of anybody who would buy at those different price points is going to get a different return. Okay, the business didn't change. It's exactly the same. It's producing the twenty thousand dollars. But as you went through different purchase prices, as you paid more for that business, your return went down drastically as, you, as, as those price points changed. And the same exact thing happens when you're buying stocks. If you overpay for a stock, your percent that you can expect to get each year goes down significantly. So the name of the game really comes down to what is the stock worth? And that's why Warren Buffett takes so much time and does so much detail as he's figuring out what these companies are worth. Because he knows that if he overpays for it, his yield will go down 10%, 15%, 20%. So that's really the name of the game. And that's what I really wanted you to get out of this lesson. So to summarize, we uh, had uh, four objectives. The first was to describe a small business model. The next was how money flows through a small business, a comparison of a small business and a large business, and how do you value, generically, how do you, how do you value a small business. So that uh, concludes lesson two, and I look forward to seeing you guys in lesson three.